I love that. That is 40 bucks well spent. Uh, 45. <laughs> 45, yes. Thanks for sharing it with me. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the first ever episode of Leadership and Laughs with Pete and Brian. My name is Pete, and I am based here in Trustville, Alabama. And I'm Brian Vaghi, <laughs> as, 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 uh, as heard in our intro music, and I'm based right here in beautiful Denver, Colorado, way up in the mile high, Pete. Nice to have you, Brian, out in the mile high. Uh, Brian and I have been talking about doing a live podcast slash radio slash everything for the past, uh, gosh, 20 years. Oh, yeah, at least 20 years. I, I didn't know you were yeah. asking me that question. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be great so far. <laughs> yeah, first one. Um, yeah, yeah, 20, 20 years we've, we've, uh, you know, we used to work together at Walt Disney world. This is a small entertainment company based in central Florida. You may have heard of it. And, uh, we, uh, we used to sit around and just kind of make witty banter and, uh, our, our wry observations maybe about leadership and, and, uh, and we would laugh and we thought, Hmm, this could be a show. This could be a show. That's always we all say that this could be a show. So, so here's a couple of things to kind of get us started today, Brian. I got a couple of disclaimers, if you will, a couple sure. of uh, or maybe rules, regulations, uh, observations, however you call it. Uh, first thing is, what's the title of our show, Brian? Uh, the title of the show is Leadership and Laughs with right. Pete and Brian. Correct. It is not Laughs and Leadership. So we are in no way promising laughter in this. What we, this what is we not going to be funny. No, we are not comedians. Uh, we, we 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 really are just taking a wry look at leadership. Um, a lot of the leadership podcasts out there, and a lot of the live radio shows, are either interviews, which are great. People bring in one-on-one -on -one interviews, and they'll interview people and talk about ways to do things better. And we thought, well, let's let's take it a different way. Let's just get some current events. Let's talk about some things that happened at Disney. Let's play some game shows. Let's have some fun. We still want this to be a leadership podcast where you can learn about how to be a better manager, how to be a better supervisor, how to how to manage your teams, how to how to be a good employee. Um, but it's not from the point of, hey, here's a couple of funny comedians who are talking. It's 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 two people who live in the human resources world. Uh, we live in the world of learning and development and training and development. And so we want to share ways that that you all can help be better supervisors, better managers, better leaders, and hopefully maybe 20 percent laughs. Is that, yeah, some, is that <clears throat> some laughs? Yes. Yeah, some laughs along the way. Uh, you know, and if if uh, if we're not careful, we might learn something. Correct. So if you would like to uh, cackle uh, as we go through this, uh, maybe chuckle a little bit. There might be a guffaw. Correct. <laughs> Correct. Maybe yeah, maybe you will tee hee along the way. We don't know. <laughs> maybe uh, a cackle. A cackle. <laughs> a chortle or two might come. So you never know. You never know. So here's what we're going to do. We have a bunch of different segments, and uh, we are planning this to be about 30 minutes, 45 minutes. Who knows? But here's a couple other things we want to make you aware of. Um, there's a text box if you're listening live on Podbean. Uh, so you can text your thoughts, text your questions, text things in, in the chat box along the way. If you can't hear us, if the music is too loud, if, if you dislike this segment. And at the very end, we're going to let you all call in as well. So we will have a segment called the Caller Cattle Call. So at the end, you can call in and let us know what you think. That's kind of the whole point of going live. Um, if we didn't want to have people call in and have people tweet and text along the way, we could just record this and put it up uh, that but instead we're taking a huge chance by doing this live. brian who else would do this live uh nobody nobody else right. would do this live. <laughs> this is a terrible idea i know in fact both of our wives have told us that if this is a train wreck we might both be sleeping on our respective couches so uh we cannot do anything to embarrass our families there can be no editing uh there can be nothing so what you hear is what you get so this is going to be a train wreck. No, um, no, uh, 
No second chances. No no, second, no, you, no fixing it in post-production. There is no do-overs. We will not be heading into the Disney MGM Studios Bungalow One uh, and uh, putting our team together to to edit it. So uh, we'll do that. I, I mentioned Colin at the end. I mentioned texture comments. And uh, you can always let your friends know about this, too, if they want to want to listen in. So, Brian, let's get started. Are you ready? I'm ready to lead it off, Pete. I'm going to bring up what I call the leading off music. Oh, yeah. This segment is called Leading Off with Brian. Because Brian rocks hard. Brian rocks hard and leadership rocks hard and this music rocks hard. And we got to figure out how to... All right, Brian. Tell us what leading off is all about. And tell us what leading you're going to talk about. Yeah, leading off. We're gonna, we're gonna uh, take a look at some leadership in the news. Uh, some some news items that you know uh, revolve around leadership in some form or fashion. And right. uh, and then we're gonna talk about them. And I'm gonna kind of hit you with these. Uh, I've got I've got three prepared. Are you ready? Let's do it. Let's lead off, so, my brother. So we're gonna lead off with everyone's favorite subject pete which is <clears throat> uh medical product recalls oh we're losing listeners as we speak <laughs> no <Okay>. actually <laughs> the medical product recalls Let's medical go, product re this is actually all about women in leadership uh, okay one of our favorite subjects here on leadership and laughs i just decided it um <laughs> according to uh to new research from the university of notre dame have you heard of them yes i have no notre dame. Dame. Yeah. yep uh uh, severe product problems that injure or kill customers, right? So we were talking about medical product recalls. And, uh, you know, any severe product problems that could uh, seriously injure or kill customers, those are recalled, Pete, much faster when there are women on the board of directors. All right, so let me hear you straight. There are companies out there that are making medical equipment and there may be defects. They may have some problems with them. They may have to recall them because they are causing injuries. Is that what it I mean? It happens, saying? right. Okay. And that happens faster uh, when there are women on the board of directors, according to this new research. And not only that, <clears throat> but lower severity uh, products, um, you know, like defects that might be uh, hidden or not recalled, th those actually happen less also when there are female directors. So they found that compared to boards composed of all male directors, uh, those with female directors announce high severity recalls, get this, 28 days faster, which is a 35% reduction in recall timing. Okay, this doesn't surprise me because as I hear all the time from my wife, guys are stupid. So, <laughs> so, so, so you put a bunch of men in a room on a board of directors and we just want to push the product through. Just make it happen. Make it work. Make it fixed. You're telling me that when there's female leadership involved in the room, they're going to say, hold on, let's double check. Let's check everything. Let's find the flaws. And they're going to have a little more attention to detail than we are. And they're, they're going to recall these. How much faster did you say? So it's 28 days faster. Good grief. That's 28 days of people getting in insufficient equipment. So right. leadership lesson from this, Brian, um, would be what? Just make sure that we diversify our leadership teams? Yes. And it's, you know, we, we, we've talked before, uh, Pete, you and I, about groupthink and, and um, you know, uh, having a leadership team that doesn't have any diversity in thought or uh, culture you know, that can be dangerous. And in, in this case, it could truly really be a matter of life or death. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, buddy, that's a good one. Let's take us to, to number two. Here we go. Story number two on leading off. All right, leading off. It's come to this, Pete. Are you ready? Yeah, I'm stopping the music. I don't know why I feel excited. <laughs> it gave wow. me lots of buttons. Lots of buttons to play with. Okay, love it. You run the board. <laughs> Uh, the San Francisco Bay Area. Out ah, out west. They are listening at 6 a.m. this morning. That's the left coast. Uh, San yes. Francisco Bay, which is known, of course, for being at the forefront of uh, both environmentalism, but also their swift response in taking measures to limit the impact of the coronavirus pandemic sure. that we're all dealing with. Absolutely. Well, those two worlds are colliding. Um, because the San Francisco Bay Area has now banned reusable grocery bags. I thought that they banned plastic 
grocery bags. Well, previously they banned plastic grocery bags, but now okay. they have banned reusable grocery bags because of the risk of con uh, contamination oh. of COVID-19. Gotcha. <clears throat> So I don't know. So Woody, Woody banter about that. It's really just the latest sign of, uh, you know, how dramatically the the coronavirus pandemic that we're dealing with is is altering our social landscape. Well, think about that. I mean, if you're managing a grocery store right now and you've done away with plastic bags and you're saying, sorry, we don't do that. We're doing all. I think there's a grocery store here in town called Aldi. We've got that where you have to bring your own bags and bring your. And so, you know, people are Walmart sells the bags, Publix, they, they, they all sell these like cotton sort of bags. But now you're saying out west, they're saying, don't bring those in because we those still carry the coronavirus on them. So how am I how am I carrying my groceries out if I can't right. use plastic and I can't use my home? Can I still bring in the paper? The, can I still bring in my own bags? You can still bring in your own bags. You know, recycling advocates are, are saying that they would prefer a statewide policy uh, where customers can bring their own bags into the stores, but then the grocery employees wouldn't have to fill them. So I'm the only one who touches my bag. I bring it in and I fill it up. Oh my word, I can't, see this is all changing so fast, I can't imagine trying to figure this out. All right, let's go, number three, my buddy. Leading off, story number three, what do you got? All right, so there's a company called Fastenal. Ah, I've heard of Fastenal, yeah. Fastenal, yeah, Fastenal. so, uh, you know, the, you mentioned that we've been uh, discussing this radio show or podcast for many years, and yes. we kind of got serious about it maybe uh, five six months ago, and so I I've I've kept this story in my pocket, Pete. Um, <laughs> this, this is so, this is when we were going to start six months ago. You said I got to wait six months to share this with me. Exactly. <laughs> so um, I I mentioned the company's called Fastenal, and a Fastenal uh, manager lost his job, Pete, after an angry tweet criticizing ah. their company's holiday gift. Excellent. I think I'll get on social media and mock the company that pays my bills. Excellent so, idea. <laughs> so yeah, it was a it was a branch manager. Get this in Canada, okay. uh, who he was he was fired just before New Year's Day for violating company policy. Right when he basically uh, lobbed a tweet criticizing the company's choice of a holiday gift, which was, are you ready? I'll lay, lay it on me. Barbecue sauce and a wooden grill scraper. Which to me sounds delightful. I live in the South. I love to barbecue. My company says, great job. Here's a can of or a jar of barbecue sauce and a grill scraper. I'm, I'm, Brian, I'm happy. Happy happy <laughs> holidays to me. What is so wrong with that gift? Uh, well, this this branch manager wasn't happy with it. He, he <laughs> Here's what he said. He goes, uh, he okay, says. Read, read the tweet to me. What is it? What kind of multi-billion dollar company gifts its Canadian employees barbecue sauce as a holiday gift, but the USA employees stuff their face with an actual holiday gift box. Oh, so there were two different, there were two different holiday gifts? Right, apparently this company uh, is in both Canada and the United States, and um, he was not happy that he got barbecue sauce and a wooden grill scraper, and apparently, uh, the U.S. workers got something of an equi equivalent value, but it was more of a what he called an actual holiday gift. An actual food by the big old ham. America, I love you. Turkeys, hams, happy holidays. Canada, here's some sauce. <laughs> so yeah. I can see. <laughs> I can see that. All right. So leadership lesson from that is what, Brian? Well, you know the uh, Society for Human Resource Management. You might know them as SHRM. Well, uh, well, SHRM, yeah, ha has basically you know advised member companies to um, adopt clear warnings in their employee policy guides and manuals about you know how workers should conduct themselves online and what consequences exist for ignoring those policies. And, you know, social media, we do a training class where I work, Brian, about social media, social media fundamentals, the benefits, the landmines. And we got to be real. All of us as employees, supervisors, managers, what's your policy on social media? I mean, we, we could do a whole hour show on, on social media. In fact, I was just talking to my smoking hot wife, Sherry, this morning before she went to work. She works for a very large uh, hospital uh, organization. 
And she, there are a lot of people right now who work in hospitals who want to tweet out photos and put out photos that say things like, we're working hard for you. Uh, we're here at work so that you can be safe. And so there's pictures of them in their PPE and there's pictures of them in their hazmat suits. And they're saying, can we put this out on social media? And the response is a lot of times from the corporate communication, oh no, no, don't put that out. Number one, you're not standing six feet apart. You know, right. so there's this idea of, I want to share, but you got to be real careful that when you share on social media, it doesn't come back and bite you or your, or your organization. You know, and and it also ties in a little bit when you know when we talk about social media, it's so pervasive that uh, I think this also goes to family leadership. I tell my kids all the time, I'm so glad that social media didn't exist when I was a teenager. Oh, <laughs> I'm so glad that video cameras and phones didn't exist right. when we were seen it. Yeah, the challenges are unbelievable. All right, that was leading off. Before we get to our next segment, Brian, I want to give a, a, as they say in the radio business, a shout out to Savannah, to G-Bone, uh, Sherry. Uh, that's, oh, criminy, my wife is listening. That's okay, smoking Sherry, hot wife. That's my smoking hot wife. And T. Voggy, Capo, Surfer Fox. Uh, Buglet, I'm excited about that. Kimber, Joseph, John Freeze, Music Lady. Uh, we have 16 people online, and we were expecting four. So we're already, we're all, we've already tripled or quadrupled that. So glad to have you on. Stick with us as we get to our next segment, which is called what, Brian? They did what? Oh my word! Let's go. From the annals of the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. We've got a segment called, what's it called, Brian? They did what? They did what? All right, so those of you who are listening overseas, because I'm sure we have plenty of listeners overseas, uh, we're going to do a segment today called They Did What? This is going to be about leadership and management mistakes. This is where we stand back and we mock people who make stupid decisions that cost their organization (laughs) and thousands of dollars. So There will be mocking. There will be mocking, there will be making fun of, and we know that uh, that y'all are doing your best as leaders. But let's go ahead and take a take a listen. Now, it, in all seriousness, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, Brian, that's based in the United States of America. If there is a problem with discrimination, harassment, employment claims, hostile work environment here in America, we go to the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. So all I do is pick out a couple of articles recently where settlements are made. We talk about what happened and we talk about how stupid these managers were. Are you ready? I'm ready, but they did what? Okay, hold on a second. And say it again. (laughs) They did what? They did what? I could just do this all day. They did, okay, all right, stop. All right, so anyhow, um, all right. Construction company in Fort Lauderdale, back back where you used to be, back in the Fort Lauderdale, Florida. It's going to pay $38,000 to settle a sexual harassment, sexual discrimination suit. Here we go, y'all. You know, you're getting old and you got to get out the old reading glasses. Um, the, EEO, the EEOC charged in its lawsuit that this company, BHT Construction, violated federal law by failing to hire a well-qualified female applicant because of her sex. According to the lawsuit, the woman who applied as a heavy machine operator and had over 20 years experience doing the job was denied employment. Now, there's one thing, Brian, to say, oh, we're going to hire somebody else, this and that, you know, I'm not sure. But here's, here's what the BHT supervisor told her when she came in for her interview. He said, quote, we do not hire women, end quote. That was it? <laughs> That's it. So, bam, lawsuit filed, $38,000 payment to that person. So, leadership lesson, Brian, would be what? Uh, don't be stupid. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's just, yeah. Hey, by the way, we don't hire women. I know that you've got 20 years experience and you've done heavy machine operator, but none for you. All right, story number two on what? They did what? They did what? Right. They did what? <laughs> By the way, it's it's 2020. Just wanted to yes. point that. Out. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, the, you don't have to go to a leadership class to tell people this kind of stuff. All right, so team, you know, I don't know if that if that story that you just did the 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 BHT construction maybe that was from 1958. No, no, this was from uh, March 18th of 2020. So oh. just this month. Hey, okay. just just to keep you in the mood of how stupid we are, this is a garage door company out of Newark, New Jersey. TGS Garage and Doors. They sell, they install, they repair garage doors and garage door openers. They're going to pay fifty-five thousand dollars to settle a racial harassment. Hashtag suit. not a sponsor. Hat- <laughs> 
Yeah, there goes the, there goes those dollars. According to the suit, this company TGS Garage and Doors subjected its only black service technician. Hey, we hired one more black service technician to racial harassment. His supervisor and co-workers made comments about his skin color, used racial slurs, frequently made racist jokes, and, Brian, in response to a racist comment that was made in a meeting in front of the general manager, the general manager laughed rather than taking corrective action. And yeah, the environment, the leadership right there. Yeah, so the environment was so egregious that the technician was forced to resign. They've got a three-year consent decree. They're going to pay him fifty-five grand. They're also got to go through hostile work environment training. They're going to have to have an anti-discrimination, which you should have had in the first place. Can you believe? Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, again, it's not nineteen fifty-eight. Yeah, I don't understand how this is happening. Let's do one more, Brian. They did what? You're good at that. Uh, all right. <laughs> I'm sorry. You did what? Excuse me? All right. Bay County. We're in Bay County. We're in Baltimore, Brian, for our big finish. This was $74,000. $74,000 for a harassment and retaliation claim. Let's talk about this. Number one, uh, this is a, uh, a concrete company. Uh, they got two federal harassment. Why have? Hey, let's play two. Let's play two today. Uh, two federal harassment and retaliation lawsuits. And the first one, Bay County's owner repeatedly used racial slurs and fired a secretary in retaliation for her opposition. So again, great leadership. The secretary goes to the leadership and says, hey, want to let you know you probably shouldn't be doing this. And their response is, bam, you're fired. Okay, good job. <laughs> well done. Well done, That's, leader. Yeah. Number two. The Bay County subjected a concrete finisher who's male and African-American to racial and sexual harassment. The harassment included racial slurs, sexual comments, gestures, threats. The concrete finisher had to call the police, it was so bad, Brian, to file charges after one co-worker groped him and another intentionally poked him with a shovel handle. According Wait a to minute. <laughs> Wait a minute. I, I didn't think you could. You, you can't sexually harass a male, can you? Uh, male to male sexual harassment, Brian, what? happened. That's not oh, a thing. Uh, Come on. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. People are so. Uh, I can't believe I have to read this stuff. And most of you all listening are going, yes, we know that's wrong. Because the people who should be listening probably aren't even aren't even on here. Um, and he, Brian, here's the here's the leadership lesson. The, the, the concrete finisher complained about the harassment and Bay County fired him in retaliation the same day. It's one thing if there's harassment in the workplace and the manager gets involved and says, hey, what's going on? Do an investigation. But once you once you tell somebody, once you tell leadership, let anybody know that there's a possible hostile work environment, possible thing going on. If you don't investigate, if you don't report, if you don't do that, now you've got retaliation. Now you've got, you know, all these things happening. So $74,000 to them. Unfortunately, we've got hundreds more of these we can share next week in our another episode of... They did what? Thank you. Like, you have no, you have no idea I'm going to... <laughs> I'm going to do that. I had to clear all my right. throat for that one. There. All right. Hey, Brian, we're up to 19 listeners. Let's go, baby. All Glad right. to have you all on board. Thanks for listening. We're going to keep going. Our next segment is going to be led by Brian. It's called it's called Over and Under. And I've got a little fun game show Over Under music, Brian. Let this let this roll off your shoulders for a second. Oh yeah. Oh, I'm vibing with this. It's time for Over and Under with your host, Brian Vaji. Ha. <sighs> Oh, everybody's oh, hold on. yeah. Hold on. Give me hold some, on. give me some applause. I'm sorry, I forgot. I've got so many buttons. Well, hey, you're everybody, home. it's over Brian under. Foggy. All right, it's, it's time for everybody's favorite game <laughs> show, where uh, basically what I'm going to do, Pete, is I'm going to I'm going to hit you with some uh, percentages, some numbers, we'll and uh, and we're going to have you know, uh, there's no sports going on right now. Uh, so we're gonna have uh, this. This is our little betting segment. Consider oh, me your bookie. You're my leadership uh, bookie. I love I'm it. I'm your and leadership if, bookie. Way, if you're listening live right now or listening on the recording, you can play along. You can play along and go. Oh, that's got to be over. Oh, that's got to play along. Have some fun with us. In fact, if you're on your phone, you can type in the text box if you think the answer is going to be over and under to show how smart you are. If anybody gets all three correct, we will send you a America's Funniest Home Video T-shirt. 
Wait, no, so, no, that's not true. We're not okay, going to do that. Never mind. We're going to send right, you go barbecue ahead. sauce and a wooden grill <laughs> script. <laughs> All right, go ahead. Bring it on. All right. So uh, today's facts come to us from our good friends at Bloom Leadership. That's bloomleaders.com. And so, Pete, these are going to be interesting statistics about effective leadership, okay? Let's do it. So we know that empowering your employees and showing appreciation is one of the simplest things that you can do as a leader to just, you know, help grease the wheels, help keep Gotta things appreciate running Gotta smoothly, say right? Got to say good job. I hear you, buddy. Yeah. So, all right. The percentage of employees who quit due to, quote, lack of appreciation, end quote. So in this, we're looking at the percentage of employees who quit due to lack of appreciation. Is okay. it over or under 75%? Uh, it I'm sounds like the over or under at 75%. The number employees. of employees who quit, I would, I think the answer is going to be over because you wouldn't bring it up if it wasn't a high number, but that'd be stupid if that many people actually quit because they didn't get recognition. So give me the under, Brian. Give yourself a bell, Pete. 79% of employees quit due to lack of appreciation. I don't get a bell. I, I, I got it wrong. I said lower. Oh, then, oh, you're fired. Okay, so 79% of employees <laughs> quit due to lack of appreciation. Uh, it is worth noting that another statistic uh, quotes that a similar percentage of bosses think that employees quit because they want more money. So look, like 79% of employees quit due to lack of appreciation and about 79% of uh, bosses think employees quit because they want more money. Yeah, and again, leadership lesson, everything from exit interviews need to be done when your people leave. Uh, managers need to not have their heads in the sand and think, oh, I'm sure they're leaving because they want 5% more. Most people you know, aren't leaving for 5% more. Most people are leaving because no one's telling them, thank you, great job, I appreciate you. So absolutely. All oh, right. that was a good one, Brian. All right, and by the way, no it. one let the record show that no one played along. That's not true. That's not true at all. Look, JC said over. Michael Glazer said over. Savannah said under. G Bone said over. And John Freeze said over. Oh, good. God, do you know what's funny? That's not showing up on my thing, so I'm gonna have to figure that out. You okay. you actually can see something I can't. How does that make you feel? Uh, that makes me feel appreciated, Pete. <laughs> you are in the majority. All right, go ahead. Number two. <clears throat> All right, let's talk about millennials, everybody's favorite subject. Uh, Brian, talk- allow me to interject my thoughts on millennials here. I know <laughs> we tend to have a stereotype about millennials, and I know that millennials hate being called millennials. So Correct. So the word millennials, we are not embarrassing or trying to stereotype anybody. We're just reading the word that is on the paper in front of us. That's right. We've been talking about millennials for 20 years. I mean, <laughs> goodness. Very good. Um, the, so percentage of millennials who feel a lack of leadership development in the workplace. All right. O- over or under 60%. So when we say millennials, like Pete said, we're talking about a particular age group, a younger age group in the workforce. And I'm going to put the percentage of millennials who feel a lack of leadership development in the workplace over or under 60%. Uh, I'm going to go over with this one. I do know some younger uh, people. And one of the things that I've read, Brian, and learned about is they don't just uh, desire professional development and leadership development. They expect it as part of the new normal of what working in a company is. So like they used to say on card sharks, I'm going to go higher. I'm going to go higher, oh. higher. Excellent card sharks reference. Um, showing you. our age here. Going Pete, you're school. exactly right. 63%. Nice. 63% of millennials feel a lack of leadership development in the workplace, which let's be honest, that's kind of a scary uh, statistic because you know when you consider the fact that we're coming into, I think, one of the most significant leadership gaps in history, right? We're about to lose uh, just a huge number of leaders from the workforce. Um, I think they say 10,000 baby boomers retire from the workforce every day. Yeah. Um, So, you know, many businesses, I think, are are failing to give up-and-coming employees the leadership development that they need to succeed. 
And we're about to head into the perfect storm, Brian, because COVID-19 is going to mean once everything gets back to whatever the normal is in a month, two months, three months, uh, unfortunately, one of the first things that's probably going to be cut or scaled back in most organizations is dollars for professional development, dollars to go to conferences, dollars for you know all of these things as the belt tightening happens. So you've got all these young people who are demanding it. You've got older people who are moving on and we're not going to spend time or money to develop them. So we could have a serious perfect storm coming up as far as leadership development yep, as we move it- forward. It just underlines the importance of uh, succession planning and, and you know, creating a, a corporate culture that facilitates coaching and mentorship yep. and growth and development. So anyway, you nailed okay. It. You nailed it. All last right, one, good. last one. one. Oh. oh I nice. like this one. It's, a nice it's the same song. It's the same one. All right, go ahead. All right. Uh, Last one, and you'll see, uh, Pete, how this is related, okay? How many businesses do you think have taken the steps to implement leadership development at all levels? Zero. Not just... (laughs) I'm sorry. I do do have to wait. I will wait. You have to wait. All right. So uh, I'm going to put... So again, this is uh, businesses that you think have taken steps to implement leadership development at all levels, not just for your senior managers, not just for your executive team, but all level levels, uh, leadership development. I'm going to put the over or under at 33%. Um, I I knew you were going to go somewhere in the low. Um, You know, when I think of successful companies like Coke and Disney and Ritz Carlton and Southwest Airlines, they are putting leadership development. you know, not just for the, the senior leaders, the CEOs, but also for your mid managers, for your deputy directors, for for your frontline employees. But I don't. Uh, but I Disney don't think was really good at this, right? I know. But I don't think I'm going to go. Unfortunately, I'm going to go under, 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 under thirty three percent. Yep, that's what I think. All right. What about you, listeners? What are some of the answers you see coming in? Under, over, uh, the laugh, cry, emoji. <laughs> <laughs> what? Is it is it is under if you said under give yourself a point only five percent five percent pete stop it according to bloom leaders only five percent of businesses have implemented leadership development at all levels okay and so we've got we've got millennials yearning for leadership development and we've got companies that aren't doing it all, all the way across the board right and, so. that, and that could go to why a whole lot of people feel that you know they have limited opportunities for success because yep. you know the majority of the leadership development in an organization if they do it at all is done at the higher levels so so as we wrap up this segment of over under brian what's the overall lesson well you know again it ties into uh succession planning and appreciation and you know it seems that only a few companies are ready to meet that upcoming gap in leadership All right, so if you're out there listening, again, I know times are going to be tough, but make sure that you're providing that leadership development. That takes care of over under. Thank you, Brian. It's time for our next to the last segment before we take phone calls. And Brian, we're going to call this one the Daily Disney. Oh, the Daily Disney. What do you see walking down Main Street, Brian? I feel like I'm eating popcorn. Excuse me as I see the horse and trolley walking down Main Street. Here comes the opening show in front of the castle. There's the kids of the kingdom. Look at them. Oh, they're dancing. There's Pooh and Tigger jumping around. What a magical place. I feel like I'm standing in front of the old uh, House of Magic. Remember the House of Magic? On Dude, you're going old school Disney. All right. So this actually segment is going to be called the Daily Disney, which is stupid because it's a weekly radio show. Uh, but if we called it the Weekly Disney, then there would not be, what's it called? Alliteration. Uh, alliteration. Thank you, yeah, Brian. There would be awesome alliteration. Uh, so we're going to call it the Daily Disney. And Brian, we're up to 24 listeners. Got to be excited about that. Thank you all for joining us. So. Here's what we're going to do. Brian and I have a minimum of four weeks that we're going to be doing this. After four weeks, we will either bail out and say that was fun. We're never doing it again. Or or we'll keep doing this uh, for a while every Wednesday. So I thought, well, if we're going to do it a minimum of four times, 
let's start with the Disney quality standards. And go. let's talk a little bit about what Disney does around their quality standards and how you can apply this as a leader in your organization. So this is the Daily Disney. Okay, so and <laughs> you know that if you were in charge of the buttons, Brian, you'd be doing the exact same thing. It's All right. the segment that's so good we introduce it twice. Did we lose Pete? <laughs> no, I'm here. Okay, so let's talk about safety, everybody. Safety. All right. The Disney quality standards are safety, courtesy, show, and efficiency. And what better time to be talking about safety, Brian, than right now? You and I worked at Disney for the longest time, 13 years for me, even longer for you, I think. And um, we were, safety was drilled into our heads from day one. Cast member safety, guest safety. And you'll find some organizations now, especially with COVID-19 happening, all the CEOs, all the commercials, everything you see right now is all about people talking about, we will take safety first. Safety is important. We respect your safety. And so hopefully the companies always believe this, Brian, but I think right now you're gonna see a lot more companies, I, I hate to say jumping on the safety bandwagon, but it's gonna start becoming number one in most people's eyes in companies, both from a, from a, from a customer, guest, and from an employee perspective. Would you agree? I would agree. I think we've all seen in our emails and, and on Twitter, you know, all the companies that are uh, putting out messages that say something like, you know, uh, the safety of our, our employees and our customers is the top priority. Um, and, and I think it's coming around. I think that is going to be the top priority going forward. And it's interesting because when you and I worked at Disney, um, especially in the 90s, in a, in a pre 9-11 world, the there was security everywhere. There was always security in the Disney theme parks and resorts. In fact, a lot of their major thing was 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 around theft. So it was kind of cool working at Disney because you could walk into the theme park merchandise shops and and you just knew by looking at certain people who were shopping that they were undercover Disney security people because there's so many open doors and ways to come into all the shops. Uh, when, when when I worked at Disney's Port Orleans Resort, we you have a, a security task force that's right there and they're there to, to handle theft and to handle bad things that that kind of happen internal employee theft but it's funny in uh, in a post 9 11 world something really strange happened at disney and all the theme parks from a safety perspective uh brian what are some of those things that were instituted by the way we, we didn't practice this so i hope you know the answer what, <laughs> what were some of those things what's one of the most glaring things that was instituted in the theme parks from a safety perspective post 9 11. i i this, i don't have an answer Pete. come on what you good. i can't I you can't wait in, to hear. When you walk into the theme park, what changed? But before you even got into the theme park, what did we have to do now? Oh, there were bad checks. Ah, my man, I knew you'd be there for me. Oh, you know who else, you know who else got that right? Was the one and only Jilly Jill. The one ah. and only Jilly Jill said bag checks. Yeah, and, and again, when you think about Disney, there's a sign over Main Street USA and all the Magic Kingdoms that say, today you leave the world of today and enter the world of tomorrow, fantasy and all that. And it was really frustrating to our guests and our customers because the last thing you want to do when you go to Disney is think about your safety and security. You want to assume that it's a safe place. So it was very distracting to a lot of cast members at first because there's like bag checks everywhere and you've got to check. Then metal detectors became the norm and sometimes you got to walk through a metal detector and brian you'll you'll remember this it was a big deal not to have orange county sheriffs in plain view for the guests that is very distracting when you go to disney in a magical place to see people with guns and dogs and things like that outside the magic kingdom but you know what we heard from our guests is they appreciated it they wanted the safety to come before their experience. So even though we all thought that's so weird to be at Disney and see, you know, Orange County sheriffs everywhere walking around, I think the guests from a safety uh, appreciated it much more. You know, I was at I was at the Magic Kingdom one time uh, post 9/11 uh, with my family, and I experienced something that really only happened this one time, but it really kind of goes to show how Disney puts safety above the show right. and and courtesy and uh, I had the misfortune of attending of uh, visiting the Magic Kingdom in Walt Disney World on the 4th of July 
big mistake. Don't ever yeah. do that. That's you don't want to. <laughs> And, and it's a big mistake because while the fireworks are fantastic, uh, everyone in Central Florida is is there. So right. um, they, they did have some crowd safety issues. And after the fireworks show in the evening, they actually opened up the, uh, the gates that go kind of behind the scenes there, behind the Magic Kingdom, behind mm-hmm. all the shops on Main Street. Mm-hmm. And uh, for crowd control, they actually let us go uh, backstage, which Disney, if you if you know anything about Walt Disney World, or, you know Parks and Entertainment, uh, Disney Magic, yeah, they you, really you don't know. like that. But right. for the, in the interest of safety, they opened the gates and kind of funneled everybody out behind Main Street. And that's that's a great example because again, putting the safety of the guests first. Yes, uh, the show element may be damaged, and yes, you may see some dumpsters, and yes, you may see. Hopefully you won't see like Cinderella smoking, you know, back there or so Snow White, something like that. But but you're going to see stuff that takes away from the Disney magic. But I agree with you, buddy. From a safety perspective, we can't have everybody trampling each other down a very tight, tight Main Street area. So what I wanted to talk about real quick as we were to wrap this segment up is Bob Iger, who is, you know, uh, he, he, he was the, uh, the CEO of Disney. And now I think he's what? He's now the chairman of the board. Uh, uh, he yeah, did. I think that's right. He did an interview with with, with Barron's magazine uh, yesterday, and here's here's some quotes from from what he talked about. So very timely for us. He says Disney has always taken guest and cast safety as their top priority. He's correct about that. And in the same efforts, they are taking heed and observing what other countries are doing to overcome the health crisis and move forward once this worst has passed. Quote, we're studying very carefully what China has been trying to do in terms of their return to normalcy, said Iger. And one of the things that's obvious is they've conscripted a large segment of their population to monitor in terms of their health. You can't get on a bus or a subway or a train or a high rise building without having your temperature taken. And then he goes on to say what a new health driven guest screening procedure might look like. He says, quote, just as we do bag checks for everybody that goes into our parks, it could be at some point that we add a component that takes people's temperature as a for instance. So we've asked ourselves the question, let's prepare for a world where our customers demand that we scrutinize everybody. Even if it takes a little bit of hardship, like it takes a little longer for people to get through the theme parks, just like in 9-11, where it takes you longer to get through TSA or an office building. I think that the guests and customers will appreciate the scrutinization we're going to put on their safety. Wow. So even, I mean, so can you imagine, can you imagine? Theme park and having to wait in line to get your temperature taken? Will the guests say, this is a waste of time, I'm so angry? Or will the guests say, I'm glad Disney's doing everything they can to keep me safe? I suppose it, it depends on how they take your temperature, Pete. <laughs> hey, hold on. Don't go anywhere. Hold on. Ah! Yeah. <laughs> Uh, all right, all right so what, well, we got to check your bags and, uh, and bend over. <laughs> Excuse me. Hello. I'm sorry. Oh, hey, Doc. Using the whole fist there. Fletch reference. Okay. All right. Not going <clears> to. <throat> okay. Anyhow, so how does this affect our world, Brian? Uh, everybody who's listening right there be thinking about if you are working remotely, what's going to change when you go back to your work area? You know, we talk a lot about time clocks. You know, there's a lot of time clocks in workplaces now where you've got to swipe your ID, but also put your finger down for biometrics. Will that continue or is that whole industry going to go away because employees aren't going to want to touch? What about your cleaning crews? You know, right now, if if you work in an office building, the cleaning crew gets a certain amount of money to come in. But if you're going to ask them to do a deep clean or a safety clean or wipe down stuff, with more expense, is that going to mean more costs for your cleaning crews in your office buildings? Are, are, are they going to raise their rates? Uh, what about when you bring in food to the office and you order from a company that comes and sets up a, a, a buffet style like a taco bar or something like that? Are, are the people who come to your meetings and trainings going to go, well, I don't want to get it that way because I don't want to touch the same spoon someone else has been touching so we have to go to only bar. i mean there's there's so many implications that we don't know not just about what the laws and policies are going to be around safety brian but also about what the culture is going to expect from both an employee and a customer perspective and i think that's where we as leaders have a lot of places to actually learn and grow are you there brian did i lose you 
Uh, yeah, you did lose me for a second there. I think we had our first uh, little technical gaffe. Yeah, well, that happens, man. So, so any last words on safety, my friend? I think we need to go ahead and take uh, two or three callers and see what they have to say about this and, I and love anything that. else we, we have, talked about. We have no music, so it's time for the caller. Caller. <laughs> it's time for the caller cattle call. The caller cattle call. I'd like to hear what your expectations are around safety in the workplace when you go back to work. If you have the Podbean app on your phone, there should be a button that just says call in. Um, call on in, share a, a quick thought with us. What do you expect going back to work? If you are currently working full time, have there been any safety precautions going into place? What are your biggest fears? What are your biggest worries? Uh, what's happening uh, when that comes to you. So let's go ahead and put on just some call-in music. Let's punch them um, up live. Punch them up live. I need somebody, and we're not joking about this. Somebody please call. Uh, otherwise, <laughs> we please do this live because we could have just recorded this by ourselves. So the beauty of this is for people to call in and do that. So we've got our first caller. It is someone named uh, Capo. So let's get Kpo on the line and see what she thinks about safety in the workplace. Hey, Kpo, go ahead. Good morning. This is Kpo is actually long for Kp. Oh, nice. Well, glad to have you. Oh, another one of our former Disney. Hey, hey, hey. hey in the house. How could in I not miss house. this? Thanks for Can't calling. Okay, so I could talk about a thousand things, but I will be specific to safety as you requested. Um, so working in the restaurant business, this call, this wake up call in the past three weeks has been a reminder of things we should have been doing already. So things like when you're preparing food in the back of the house, you should always have gloves on. Um, now we've added masks. Now we've added taking temperatures. We're still doing delivery and takeout. That's the reason our restaurants are still open. Okay. Um, but it, what I think has brought to everyone's attention is a reminder of things that we should have always been doing. Extra wiping down of countertops and delivery boxes and not allowing the delivery biker to walk in the back door of the restaurant. So what I'm confident will continue on is um, following through on policies and practices that we kind of had putting on the back burner and on the back seat and not paid attention to. I think it's raised everyone's awareness of regardless of a pandemic nationwide going on or countrywide or worldwide, um, that really we should always be thinking about safety and proactive things to prevent illnesses, contamination, et cetera, in the workplace. Are you what a great it? comment. Are you seeing KP with your um with your takeout? Are people expecting uh, the bags to be stapled up and not handed to them a certain way? Are they expecting people to have gloves on when they take their their payments? That I mean, what's what what yeah. are the customers uh, saying? Yeah. So um, interesting. Great question. Our guests do not want someone knocking at their door um, and they don't want to pass hands. So first and foremost, if we're doing delivery, leaving it at the door, um, we have had to change our procedure. So no longer requiring a credit card signature because we don't want to exchange the credit card and the receipt going to the individual. So everything we had to very quickly fast forward electronics and not asking people to share their credit card or, you know, pin number over the phone. So that had to evolve very quickly. So that's an expectation of a guest. But then in our rest, we're in big cities, right? New York, DC, Chicago. The guests are actually still wanting to, when they're doing pickup, they're still wanting to come into the restaurant. They're, they're at home, they're in their apartment, they're bored, they want social interaction. And we've actually had to put measures in place where we're putting um, temporary tables in the vestibule, in the foyer, and leaving them stapled with people's names on the front of them so they can come in and not wait outside in the rain and the cold, but just grab their bag and to protect our team members, not have interaction face to face. Um, so it's interesting wow. that some guests want us to promise that we're being safe and doing everything we can, but then there's other guests who are encroaching on our employees' safety, and we've had to put measures in place to literally and physically put up um, a barricade between them and us. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Not to, not to stereotype, Brian, but uh, the introverts say, bring it to me. The extroverts are like, I'm going in. I'm going in, baby. I'm going <laughs> somebody. Will anybody talk to me? Oh, well, thank you for sharing that, KP. Hang in there and keep doing the great work you're doing and maybe call in again uh, next week as well. Thank you. All right. 
Appreciate it. Thank you so much. We've got one more caller coming in, Brian. Can we have time for one more? Let's do one more. All right. Savannah is on the air. Savannah, go ahead. You're on the Leadership and Laughs with Pete and Brian. Hello, everyone. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Hi, Savannah. Thank you. Sorry, because it's my first time calling. That's why I'm somehow nervous. But I just want to talk about the topic that you chose about safety after the situation, after locking down. Uh, I'm calling from Kurdistan, which is uh, maybe you've known it. it's a part of Iraq. Right. Uh, now the place is because yeah another places all the places schools restaurants shopping malls everywhere is closed because of the situation that we have it of coronavirus uh i work in a school it's an elementary oh. school uh, oh. i think yeah i think after this locking uh locking down when we go back to school it's our greatest responsibility to take care of the children, especially from KG to grade six, because they really don't know much about how to protect, how to take care of themselves, especially when they go to uh, having lunch and bringing water and when they play in the playground. Uh, it would be really difficult to control and to check all the students, but it's our priority to keep them safe. Absolutely, and and I have to ask, Savannah, are 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 the schools still open in Kurdistan? No, of course not. It's been okay. more than a month. Everywhere yes. is closed. Yes. This will be interesting too, Savannah. When you go back to a normal school room, what the parents and what the guardians will expect you all to do versus what you are actually going to be physically able to do from a health and safety perspective? Like, will they want the desks wiped down every day and every pencil wiped down? And, you know, I don't want my child going up to the front of the room and touching a piece of chalk or the chalkboard or the dry erase board because some other child may have touched it. I mean, all of those questions are going to start coming out because you're going to expect the schools, right, to truly protect the children. So it might even change the way yeah. that you have to teach. It's yeah, actually, it's right, because I talked to many parents. They told me that it's really hard if we send our child back to school because we don't know whose child are going to be his friend, with whom mm. she or he will sit in the same class. And how is she going to drink water? Are they use the same glass to drink the water? Oh. Uh, they will touch the tabs. They will touch the bottoms, everyone. So it would be a really difficult job. But I hope this situation will go over soon, because if not, we are going to lose this year of study. Right. Right. Well, Savannah, we hope the best for you when you go back. We thank you for listening. You are our first ever overseas listener who called in. So we are extremely, extremely grateful for you. And can we just ask you, how did you, how did you find out about the show? Thank you. Actually, it was accidental. I just downloaded the, the uh, application and I just searched and I heard that you're, you have a show about leadership and loves and then I started listening. Yay! Oh. <laughs> we'll take it. We'll I'm take really, it. <laughs> Make sure you accidentally <laughs> tell I'm your really friends. Happy we'll be about <laughs> this. <laughs> well, good. Well, we'll be on again next week at the same time. So accidentally tell more of your friends uh, to listen on and learn some learn some leadership I, tips. Thank I you so much for calling. I definitely tell them because I have lots of friends. They really like to listen. Excellent. Well, Excellent. thank you so much and stay safe over there. That's right. Thank you very much. Have a nice time. You too. Thank you. Thank you, you too. Brian, how does that make you feel? Uh, no, I'm so glad that Savannah called in. That was that was that was so nice. I love it. I love I love to hear uh, the perspective also from you know people who are we're all going through a shared experience, but in our own cultures and in our own countries. And um, that was really really terrific. Thank you, Savannah, and for calling. Thank you for calling. And leadership crosses boundaries, as we all know. Doesn't matter if you're in this country, some other country, different states. So that's going to end our caller cattle call because we're coming up on the end of our hour. But Brian's going to finish us up with a fun topic called "Did You Know?" Did you know, Brian?
All right, I, I wasn't sure if I was going to have a uh, uh, digital music or not, <laughs> I but um, find, I couldn't that's find okay. it. That's okay. Let's let let's. Uh, so this is just a little did you know? Uh, we used to have, wasn't it Sports Center that had a, like a little uh, did oh, you know right. fact at the end? So we're okay. So we're, I'll do it for you. Uh, da 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 da. Did you did know? Did you know? <laughs> All right. So going back uh, real quick, just circling back to you know companies being unprepared for the upcoming gap in leadership as our baby boomers retire. You know we said previously that only five percent of businesses have implemented inclusive leadership development opportunities at all levels, right? Um, but Pete, did you know that da, 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 many, da, da, da. <laughs> Did you know that da, da, da. Many... <laughs> So I'm sorry. Go. <laughs> all right, Lucy, I'm going to kick this football. <laughs> did you know that as many as 83% of organizations have deemed this as an important action for succession? So while only 5% of businesses have actually done it, 83% of organizations have deemed it important. So they know it's important, but they just haven't done it yet. Okay, that's, those numbers are astounding to me, Brian. We're talking about, um, you know, those aren't even close as far as the correct 83% say, we know we should, but 5% are. That's just dropping the ball as leaders. That's something we all can take with us. It's easy to talk about leadership, but it's hard to actually do it on a daily basis. Wow. So, yeah, don't get caught in the leadership gap, folks. What does that music mean, Brian? That means we've had some leadership and we've had a couple of laughs. And it's time to say goodbye for this week. I want to thank our 25 listeners for listening today. We're going to upload this to a social media site. And uh, you can tell all your friends to listen on streaming as well. But we'll be back here again, Brian, when? Next? Next, next Wednesday, Wednesday. Same time, same place. Same time, same place. Hey, uh, from Trustville, Alabama, this has been Pete. And Brian from the 303. Thanks for joining us on Leadership and Laughs. We'll see you next time.